Go ahead. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We have a wonderful show for you this morning here at Waters Edge Church. Uh, we're going to get a little singing, not much dancing, and then Cal is going to talk about one of the minor prophets. I'm not sure which one it is yet, but he's going to do that. Zephaniah. Zephaniah, I'm told. Yeah. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that's good. Okay. So, I mean. Well, good morning, and welcome to Waters Edge Church Online. As you can see, the few of us are back in the church building, uh, praise God, and um, it has been fun just getting together and being able to practice and, and sing in God's house again. Um, I hope that you have had a little bit of a better week and have been excited a little bit of some of the improvements and um, openings and things that are starting to come back to maybe a little bit of normal. But uh, for today, I'm just glad that you're here worshiping with us and, um, and praising God together. We're going to do some singing. Uh, we're going to have a message this morning and some prayer time. And um, as always, we would love if you would just join in on the chat that is going on. And you can just sign in, pick a username to be a part of that. And then you can also access the live prayer button. You can access the sermon notes and all those kinds of things as well. So I hope you take advantage of that. And we'd just love to be able to say hi and know that you're, you're here and worshiping with us. I'm going to open our service up in prayer, and then we're going to go ahead and start singing. Father God, it is a blessing to be able to be back in your house. And though all of your people are not gathering here um, with us, Lord God, we do say that wherever two or more are gathered together in your name, there you are. And so, Lord, we know that you are all over New Buffalo and Harbor Country this morning, that you are in the homes of our friends and our family, and you are in the hearts of so many, Lord God. And so I just pray that this morning is one of just amazing presence of feeling you, Lord God, of hearing your voice, and of just being able to draw so close to you in this time. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunities that you have given us to be able to continue to worship online, to be able to continue to connect with those that are around us, even during this difficult time. Lord God, we just love you, and it is in your son's name that we pray. Amen. All right, well, we're going to open up with some fast songs, so I but I really hope that you're going to be clapping at home. <laughs> this is Build Your Kingdom Here and Alive. All right, come set. Come set your rule and your reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Church, we pray. 
difference from when we used to live stream on Facebook. Um, working on trying to get everything a little bit higher quality, a little bit better, so that you can hear things better at home. Um, and I don't know what it sounds like there in your living room, but it sounds awesome in here. And I just pray that it's just um, a blessing to God's ears uh, this morning. Line up! Line up! Everybody line up! We're about to race! Everybody line up! Shoulder to shoulder! Take off your backpacks! Basketball! Line up! We're about to race! Hey, we are we are racing for a hundred dollar bill. The winner of this race will take this. A hundred dollar bill. Before I say go, I'm going to make a couple statements. If those statements apply to you, I want you to take two steps forward. If those statements don't apply to you, I want you to stay right where you're at. Take two steps forward if both of your parents are still married. Take two steps forward if you grew up with a father figure in the home. Take two steps forward if you had access to a private education. Take two steps forward if you had access to a free tutor growing up. Take two steps forward if you've never had to worry about your cell phone being shut off. Take two steps forward if you never had to help mom or dad with the bills. Take two steps forward if it wasn't because of your athletic ability, you don't have to pay for college. Take two steps forward if you never wondered where your next meal was going to come from. I want you guys up here in the front just to turn around and look. Every statement I've made has nothing to do with anything any of you have done. Has nothing to do with decisions you've made. Everything I have said has nothing to do with what you've done. We all know these people up here have a better opportunity to win this hundred dollars. Does that mean these people back here can't race? No. We would be foolish to not realize we've been given more opportunity. We don't want to recognize that we've been given a head start. But the reality is we have. Now, there's no excuse. They still got to run their race. You still got to run your race. But whoever wins this hundred dollars, I think it'd be extremely foolish of you not to utilize that and learn more about somebody else's story. Because the reality is, if this was a fair race, and everybody who's back on that line, I guarantee you some of these black dudes would smoke all of you. And it's only because you have this big of a head start that you're possibly going to win this race called life. That is a picture of life, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing you've done has put you in the lead that you're in right now. When I say go, on your mark, get set. Go! If you didn't learn anything from this activity, you're a fool. Sunday, I actually sang a brand new song 
Um, and I want to teach that song to you guys so that when we're back in the building together, we can sing it. So um, this is a, a song that's by uh, Hillsong that came out about two Easter's ago, and it's called Grace to Grace. And I just really hope that you can find freedom and just um, that you, you know that you have the overpowering of the grave inside of you. And that's what this is all about, just through God's grace, through his love. We are just so blessed to be able to say that we are free and we are conquerors. So I hope you can sing along.
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Waters Edge Church Online. I am so excited to be preaching from the church this week. And, and uh, you just know that our leadership, we're, we're trying to figure out when will be an appropriate time for us to open up. Uh, right now, the governor has said in the state of Michigan that we can gather in groups of 10 indoors. Obviously, that won't work for church. And so, uh, but we are coming up with plans. We started gathering some people. Uh, but for right now, just know we miss you. We love you. And uh, we can't wait to be together again. And we're so happy that you are logging on with other people from around this town, from around this area, from frankly from around our state and possibly even around the world. Um, we're in the middle of a series called Minor Prophets where we are learning about big lessons from small books in the Old Testament. Today, we're looking at the prophet Zephaniah. Zephaniah lived during the time of King Josiah, who was one of the few good kings. If you go and you read the Hebrew Bible, it's like bad king after bad king after bad king after bad king. And, uh, but King Josiah was one of the good ones, and he sought to make reforms, and he tried to get the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem to return to worshiping God. But by the time we get to the prophet Zephaniah, it's a little too little, a little too late. And uh, the, the people, they're just too far gone. So Zephaniah, he begins by announcing the coming of the day of the Lord. Now, we've spoken about the day of the Lord several times over the past few weeks. It's, a, it's one of the things that connects the books of the minor prophets. But uh, typically the way that it works is that the prophet will come out and he'll lay out all of the charges against the people. And then he'll announce the day of the Lord. But it's a little bit different in Zephaniah. Like, we all know, like, he knows how bad the people do it. So he begins with, the day of the Lord is coming. He's like, the day of the Lord is coming for you, Judah, for you, the people of God. The book of Zephaniah, it's three chapters long. So again, it's one of these short books that you can read in one setting. Uh, and, and so you should be able to read this book. And it can be broken down into three sections. Uh, the first section is all of chapter 1 and the first three verses of chapter 2. And within this section, we see a vivid, shock, a, a vivid and shocking reversal of the creation of the world. And so what, what Zephaniah is doing is he takes the verses from Genesis 1 and he's undoing creation. Uh, for example, we see, starting in verse 2 and, and, and read on to verse 3, uh, Zephaniah says this, coming from God, he says, I will sweep away everything from face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble. And if you go back and you read Genesis 1, you'll see that God creates the air and then he creates the birds. God creates the land and then he creates the, you know, the people and he creates the oceans and he creates, he creates the fish. So where, where here, Zephaniah, what he's doing is he's proclaiming that the reverse is going to happen, that everything is going to be undone, that humanity and all of life are going to be swept from the earth. And, and as we keep reading, we find that all of this judgment that's coming down is coming down upon God's people. It is on Jerusalem and the people of God that, that this judgment is being proclaimed against. And why is it coming down upon them? The biggest proclamation against them is that of idolatry. The people have been following false gods. And they've been following these false gods for years. And at this point, even King Josiah, who put everything he had as the king into eliminating idols, into trying to bring the people back, he couldn't get the people to stop worshiping other gods. And so we read about the jealousy of God burning towards the people. In the beginning of chapter 2, the people of Judah are called to repent from their evil ways. What else is interesting in this section is that this imagery that is used against Judah, against the people of God, it's here to tell us something. God isn't saying that all of humanity is going to be destroyed, but rather that all of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And that every aspect of the life of the people of God, that the, the aspects of life that they enjoy being part of God's chosen people, those things are going to be undone. Zephaniah goes through nearly 
every aspect of life, speaking to how it's going to go from where it is to being put into chaos. Uh, he, he says, he mentions that, that the priests and he mentions government officials. He, he, he mentions families and the king's family specifically. He, he mentions merchants and the wealthy and the warriors. As Zephaniah shifts into the second segment of this proclamation, he goes from being against Judah and God's people to include the surrounding nations as well. He calls out the Philistines and Moab and Ammon and Cush and Assyria. But then he gets to verse to, to the first eight verses in chapter three. And when he does that, Zephaniah, he, he, so he, he went from talking about Judah to talking about the people around Judah. But then he comes back to Jerusalem again. And you can just feel the anger rising up in the language. In verses seven and eight, we read this. Of Jerusalem, I thought, surely you will fear me and accept correction. Then her place of refuge would not be destroyed, nor all my punishments come upon her. But they were still eager to act corruptly in all they did. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day I will stand up to testify. I have decided to assemble all the nations together, all the kingdoms, and to pour out my wrath upon them, all my fierce anger. The whole world will be consumed by the fire my jealous anger. Do you hear those strong words? The whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. Can you even imagine the wrath of God coming down upon you? This is such strong language. So many times when we think of fire, we think of its destructive power. And, and at the end of this second section, this is what we're meant to think. We're meant to think that, th that this language speaks to destruction. And, and there have been so many threats against the people. And we are reminded that it, the justice of God is coming. And it is not because God desires to destroy. But it is because this is the destruction that the people deserve. They have broken the laws. They have given their hearts to other gods. They have lied and cheated and stolen and a whole host of other horrible things as they have, as they have chased after a life that was not their own. And if the book ended there, and then we followed the history from Zephaniah onward, we would see that everything he said up until this point comes true. Babylon raises up as a nation, and it swarms over all these nations that Zephaniah had, has prophesied against, and comes to Jerusalem and destroys the city, carries away the people, carries away the ark of God. There is death and destruction. Quite the prophet, right? But the book doesn't end there. There's a third section to the book. And, and what we find out is that the fire that God said is going to burn towards the people of God is not there to destroy them, but it's there to purify them, to make them holy, to change them so that they might be redeemed and restored. Listen to these words from Zephaniah chapter 3 in the third section. It says, Then I, God, will purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord. Notice he doesn't just say the people of Israel. He just says the people, just the peoples. He says, I will purify the lips of the peoples, not, not just God's people, but all people. And so that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, my scattered people will bring me offerings. On that day, you, Jerusalem, will not be put to shame. For all the wrongs you have done to me, because I will remove from you your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them I told you last week that punishment is never the last word with God. Zephaniah comes and he tells God's people that it is too late, that the punishment 
of God is coming, that justice is coming. That for too long they had ignored God and that the lives that they were supposed to have lived. But in God's mercy, that message is not just one of destruction, but it is also one of hope. God will purify those that humble themselves. God will not just destroy. God will root out the evil that is causing the problems and will purify it away like imperfections and metal. And then the people with these imperfections erased will be able to trust God and they will be able, they will be afraid of God. Isn't that amazing? So the first part of this book, it centers much like the other books we've read on the justice of God, on the judgment of God. There has been sin and it needs to be dealt with. But Zephaniah, he goes even further than this. The other prophets have showed us that there is hope for survival, but Zephaniah, he teaches us something different, something much different. I want to read to you the final words of this book. As you listen to these words, I want you to close your eyes. And I know you're at home, and I, and I know you're not here with me, but, but right where you are, I want you to close your eyes. There's been so much going on in, the, in, in our world in the last little while. There's protests and killings. There's a pandemic that is causing so much suffering, not just in our nation, but in our country. Racism and hate, division. And that's speaking to nothing that might be going on in your own personal heart and the issues that you may be dealing with. And so I want you to take and bring all of that into your mind, and I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to hear these words that God speaks through the prophet Zephaniah. This is how he ends the book of Zephaniah. God says this, Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all of your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you. But will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and a reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the land. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Someone needs to hear this today. That no matter where you are in this world, no matter what's going on in our world, what you have done, that God has a desire for you. God wants justice. God wants good to happen. God wants us to have our hearts changed, to be open, and God wants to refine the people of God so that we will not fear who God is. God wants to bring us home. God wants to sing over you, rejoicing because of you. One day God will take care of all the things that aren't fair in life. One day the oppressors will get what's coming to them, and all of that shame that you felt will be turned to honor. The mourning of the loss of how we normally do life, God is going to fix that. Right now, we are living in this world, and I've known so many people that are simply shaking their heads and they have no idea what to do about what's going on. I've known more than a few people that are just so fed up 
with how life is going that their anger is starting to boiling to boil over it. And we've all seen the protesting. We've all seen the looting. We've seen the angry tweets and the response from people. There is a huge amount of fear in our country right now. And at the time of me writing this, I personally feel like we are losing control as a society. The question is this, will all of this destroy us? Because honestly, right now, feels like it might. But in the book of Zephaniah, we read about a country that is morally bankrupt. And if we follow their story from the beginning all the way to the middle of chapter 3, I would think that it would be so frightening if we just read the first two sections of this book and left it there. If you removed the hope and the love from the end of this book, reading this today, I would be fearful for our nation because I would be like, oh my gosh, look, God is going to come and destroy us for the bad things that we have done. But because this book has three sections, this book is not just about justice. It's also about love. Zephaniah reminds us that, yes, God does seek justice for the wrongdoing of our world, but God isn't just a justice God. God isn't there like other gods, holding up scales, making sure that you are worthy. No, our God loves you. Our God wants to sing the praises of you. Can you even imagine that? You know, you would think, you know, we come to worship God. We come to sing to God, to give our praises to God. Well, in, in the book of Zephaniah, it says that God wants to sing praises to you. So many of us, we don't feel like we're worthy of that. But that's the thing about this God. That's the thing about our God. Our God loves us so much that God wants to sing over you. God wants to love you. And so well, the, the question that I've said that we were going to ask ourselves every single week in this series is, what can we learn about God from the book of Zephaniah? And so, what can we learn about God? If we look at our world right now, honestly, there are so many people that I think they're worried that everything is going to burn, that everything is going to fall down, that everything is going to collapse. And it can feel that way. Because the justice of God is indeed coming. But it is coming not to destroy, but to refine us. And so I want to give you hope. If you are feeling like right now this world is a hopeless place, that, that you, keep, you can't just look away from the news and, 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 and not be saddened by, by what you see when you watch what's going on in our world right now, I want to give you some hope because we have to go through this. We have to go through this refining fire because that's, what, that's how we get rid of evil. That's how we get rid of wrongdoing. Right now, there are things in our world that need to change. The change does not come easy. So this week, I want to give us all an opportunity, no matter where you are, to take that step towards God. So many people believe that God can't love them. So many people believe that God just wants to hold them accountable for the bad things that they think that they have done. Well, God has an answer for that. God said way back in, in Zephaniah that one day I'm going to make everything okay. One day God did that by sending Jesus, the perfect son, to redeem our sin. And not just my sin, not just church people's sin, but everybody's sin. God took all of that bad stuff and redeemed it. And next week we're going to be taking a look at Hosea and learning more about that word, redemption. But for this week, if you are tired and exhausted with all that you're carrying, if you are ready to let go and to trust in the promises of God, I want you to take this opportunity to put your trust in the God who loves you, the God who does uphold justice, but uses justice to refine us because God loves us. God wants nothing more than to bring you home.
home. And not a home that is dangerous, but a home that is comfortable. A home where we can find rest. And so you can do that by praying to God right where you are. And so I want to ask you now to just pray the words that I'm going to pray. Pray with me. And you don't have to like make a big deal out of it. You can just say it under your breath. So let's pray together. God, you are the creator of the universe. God, you literally have all of your creation under your control and in your hands. And God, in times like where we are right now, it is hard for us to see you, to hear you, especially over all the noise that is going on in our world. And so God, if that is someone out there today and they are scared and they don't know where you are, God, I pray right now that you would speak into their lives and that they would repeat after me and they would say, God, in my life, I have made mistakes. I have fallen short of what you would have for us. I have sinned. I have messed up. And so God, I want to trust you with my life, with all that I am. I want to give you my shame. I want to give you my mistakes. God, I want to trust that you sent your son Jesus to die for me. God, I acknowledge that you are Lord over all of creation. And now my life is God, thank you. Thank you for justice. Thank you for love. Thank you for changing me for something better. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you all. We'll see you next week. All right, let's close up singing, singing his praise, his joy. In the good times and the bad times, it's always going to be, yes, Lord God, I'm going to praise your name. I count on one thing, the same God who never fails, will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in waiting. The same God that's never failed is working on.